It's a thrill for me to be here to address you for many reasons. Number one is I love to give this lecture because I think for most of you, you'll never forget it. Not because I'm a good speaker, but because of what it means to you as wound care providers. But it's also a thrill for me to be in a room with British nurses. And the reason for that is that after the end of my training in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery, I was blessed to spend a year as a senior registrar at St. Bartholomew's in London in the thoracic unit. And I learned then that the matron, the head sister, was my boss. <laughs> that also that the quality of nursing in, in Great Britain, in the UK, is the best in the world. I have seen it all over the world. I've seen it with offshoots in India, certainly Canada. And when I speak to American nurses, they say, oh, come on, Mac. I said, no, really. So it's an honor for me, and sometimes I'm humbled to be around you because you are the heart of nursing in the world. And it's, it's a privilege for me to talk to you. But I want to talk to you about another place in the world that I think is important for wound care. I think it's important for you as individuals. And as we talk today about the earthquake in Haiti and the aftermath of the earthquake and what has happened, you will see that we talk about despair and hope. One of the things about Haiti that I tell my family and it has meant to me or for the volunteers that come is that it's life changing. If you were to understand what it is to be alive, you have to know opposites. For instance, if we all lived in the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't know what happiness was because we wouldn't know what pain was. We wouldn't know sadness from joy. Haiti gives you this every single day. The extremes are enormous. It's like no other place in the world. And I can tell you that, that what has happened in Haiti is a lesson for all of us, spiritually as individuals, clinically as medical people, and globally as people who are trying to make the world a better world. So let's begin. The Wound Care World Responds, 2010 to today, 2012. And I'd like to start with an English poem by John Donne, rector at St. Paul's, No Man is an Island, because I think this applies to us as we deal with all of our patients, with Dr. Cutting, what he told us yesterday, with your patients and your clinics, but especially in the developing world and in the face of tragedy. No man is an island, entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a cod is washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a premonitory were, as well as if a manner of thine own or thine friends were. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And on January 12, 2010, the bell tolled for all of us. January 12, 2010, catastrophe in Haiti. I'm sure each of you remember at some time when you suddenly heard that something bad had happened in Haiti, the worst possible place for an earthquake to have taken place. A population of 10 million people, a population of 10 million people were before the earthquake there were fewer than 1,000 hospital beds in the entire country. January 12th, this is Port-au-Prince. You see in the, the, this is the entire nation of Haiti. But here is where the earthquake hit, 7.0 earthquake. It lasted for one minute. And people said the roar was like a train coming through the city. And there was sudden the land was swimming like an ocean waves and suddenly there was a crash and it filled like dust from a nuclear bomb. But what are the numbers? Haiti has a population of 10.5 million people. Three million were directly affected. The death estimate from the earthquake was approximately 300,000 people. When you think of all the tsunamis and the recent earthquakes, even in the most recent tsunami in Japan, it was 25,000 people. So you know the enormity of what had happened. Buried in mass graves, 7,000 plus. Injured estimate, 300,000. Homeless, 1.5 million. Living in 10 cities. Originally, in the first two weeks, it was 1.5 million. Even today, as we speak, there are 450,000 people in Port-au-Prince 
living in tents. In the first two months, with all the people that came in, the medical people, over 4,000 amputations were, were made, and we'll tell you why this happened. The orphans before the earthquake were 380,000 estimated. After the earthquake, the orphans were probably about the same. In one orphanage, three nuns and 60 children were killed in the first minute by the collapse of the orphanage. Hospital beds before the earthquake, less than 1,000. One of the major problems that they had is the Ministry of Health population, either over 200 were either killed or injured. So the nurses and doctors were almost wiped out, especially in Port-au-Prince. Let's look at some pictures to see. And remember, Port-au-Prince is not Worcester. Port-au-Prince was crumbling in many ways before the earthquake. There were many miracles. One of the miracles that we needed was because of what happened at the port. These are full containers. You can see the force of what an earthquake can do. This is the cathedral. It looks this way today. The archbishop and 10 seminarians were killed in the first minute. This is the palace. It looks like this today. This has not been touched since 2010. Even good homes were smashed. Can you imagine, give yourself a feeling for what you're about to see, that you're at work, there is an earthquake, and this is your home, and you're leaving to go home to see if your husband and children and wife, or husband and children, or your wife and children are okay, and as you drive down the street, this is what you see. It was overwhelming. And it gets very brutal when you see the human aspect of what happened. This woman is covering her face. There were so many dead bodies that even down by the hospital where we were, you could smell a smell for the first week. It smelled like dead rats because of the bodies rotting. We could not get to the bodies. And they laid them out in the street these are scenes you did not see on CNN. It looks like something out of the Holocaust. A hearse. The sadness. Thank God for the people who came in from all over the world with trained dogs to search for missing people. And we found people as, as late as 12 to 13 days trapped in a sitting position in darkness, getting some water that they had and hearing, knowing somebody was out there but nobody could find them and nobody could get into them. And we were able to pull people out like this man at the United Nations where by the way, 200 United Nations employees were killed when the building collapsed. And he was saved after five days. But this is the face I want you to remember, the face of the Haitian people because this is a story, it's a human story. It's a story about what, how wound healing is involved in human nature and suffering. But remember the face of the Haitians, because that's what changed my life. January 14th, 2010, the second day afterwards, we were able to get a few of us quickly to get into private planes, and we weren't sure who was who. And this is the first group that I was able to get in with on Thursday. I talk about miracles, and you'll hear me talk about miracles. One of the first miracles that happened is that the, the only runway in Port-au-Prince was not damaged. Had that runway been damaged, another 100,000 people would have died. We got on the private plane, we flew in Thursday night to Haiti. Seven doctors, no nurses, no running water, no Foley catheters, no toilets, and we found in the United Nations tent almost 200 people with IVs and, and mattresses dying, dying with in diabetic acidosis, congestive heart failure, but dying from the injuries from the earthquake. These are the wards, the two tents that we saw the, the first 24 hours that we came in. Cot after cot of people crying, and you'll hear something later, the only medication that we had were tablets of morphine that we took with us in our pockets 
And I said we put them in their mouths as if they were hosts. It's, it's all we could do. And we began to see the people and see what was happening. But what kind of wounds did we see? Because when I arrived, I had this, I'm a, by training, I'm a cardiovascular surgeon, but now I'm a wound care man. And I had been involved in Haiti for years. This is why I was on this plane. But I had this sense of worthlessness. What am I going to do? There's, there, I have no material. There are no nurses to help me. We have nothing. But it was obvious suddenly that everybody had a wound. I said, this is part of the miracle that maybe why God put me here, because I'm now a wound care guy. And these are the things that we saw, crush injuries, lacerations, evulsions, compound fractures, compartment syndrome. This is a syndrome when you get a, a crushed limb and you get the fascia and the bleeding and it gets ischemic. We couldn't amputate them. We had to let them live with the compartment syndrome. And many of them would get rhabdomyolysis because of the breakdown of the blood products. And you'll see a picture of people in renal failure that we saw within three days. Remember, we didn't even have Foley catheters. We began to do amputations. We began to take care of the amputations. Split thickness, skin grafts eventually as the weeks went on. Eventually, we were able to use external fixation. In the first three weeks, in our wisdom, the orthopedic surgeons, when they came in, used intramedullary rods, and they all got infected. We had to learn as we were passing on. This was the area, time of chaos and despair. We began to use vac maintenance, and we took care of burns. But these are the basic wounds that we saw in those first few days. People said, why did you do so many amputations? This was an obvious amputation because we had no antibiotics and this was an open, dirty fracture. They all had to be amputated. Here's a patient in renal failure from compartment syndrome and rhabdomyolysis. And it was dirty. And we had children and many of the children had no parents. Their parents were killed or brothers and sisters were killed and there was dirt. And on the third day we did our first amputation on this table under local anesthesia. Somebody from CNN said to me, Dr. Mack, how would you describe this? And I said, and this is America talking, this is Gettysburg. This is Gettysburg. We're amputating everyone. We're doing what we can. We amputated arms and legs. But when a patient died or a patient was transferred to somewhere else, and that was rare, this was the cut that was left, urine stained. We were suddenly afraid of cholera and typhoid. The floors were dirty. There were flies. There were mosquitoes. It was 90 degree heat. And we had no way to clean things. This is a picture on the fourth day of one of the most prominent cardiovascular surgeons in Fort Lauderdale, my home, dressing, the dressing on this child. And this doctor said to me, John, this moment in Haiti was the most important thing I ever did as a physician. And that's why I show his picture, because I know who this is. And this is what he said reminded me of what it was I felt like the first time somebody came to me when I was in medical school and said, doctor, and they meant me. I had this feeling. The nurses said, they began to, when they came, they had the feeling. It was the first time when somebody looked at them as a nurse and they knew it was them. It brought us back to our vocation. This was the table we found the night we arrived. This is all the equipment we had for the patients. Every one, the seven doctors, we began grabbing de debris, gauze, instruments, to change dressings, to clean up dirty wounds. And it suddenly dawned on me that we needed a wound care program. So the way we were going to have a wound care program, I wasn't sure how to do it, but we started the first wound care program on the third day after the earthquake. And this was my next miracle. This nurse walked up to me on the third day as the nurses were beginning to come in and said, Dr. McDonald, can I help you? I said, do you know anything about wound care? She said, I know nothing about wound care. I said, perfect. You're just the person I want because you won't, you won't question what I think I'm going to do. She said, what are you going to do? I said, you and I are going to go out to where they're dumping supplies. We're going to find all the wound care supplies we can, and we're going to hide it. What do you mean you're going to hide it? Because what I want to do is when they come to get the supplies, say, you're an ICU nurse, you're a cardiologist, you're a hematologist. 
we're the wound care people. You tell us where the patient is, we'll change the dressings, we'll do the wound care, you do what you have to do. And that's the way we began our first wound care center. We got boxes, we put the supplies were coming in, and, we, and when we'd find supplies, you know, I'll show you later, they used to pile boxes of trucks with boxes. We would find things for cataract transplants. We did, I mean, you never knew what you were gonna find. But we were able to get wound care supplies, and I was so proud to put that sign up between the two United Nations tents. The U is the University of Miami Wound Care. And this is the way it began. And you'll see the theme of the, of the talk today is from chaos to order. So who's gonna do the wound care? On the fourth day, this young lady, doctor, said, can we help you? And I said, here's what I want you to do. And I realized what we had to do is we had to keep it simple. We had to teach them basic things. We had a teacher, we want you to clean out the wounds, the dirty wounds, and we had betadine and we had peroxide. Clean it out as best you can, debreed what you can, take Vaseline gauze to keep the wound moist afterwards, and use some kind of a bandage, Curlex. And they'll write on the bandage when you did it, and we'll change it every three days. After the first week, we didn't use the betadine, and I'll show you these techniques, but to keep it simple, because none of our people were wound care people as the teams came in. So we said, in the beginning, the dirty wounds, the beta dye and the peroxide, but after that, just saline or soap and water, debride, clean it out, Vaseline gauze, change every three days. We couldn't do cultures, but in the first three weeks to four weeks, we don't think we had any wound infections, just on that basis. This was our sleeping in the tents in the United Nations tent. This is, these are the medical people as they came in. That's a typical surgeon to me. No, it's really not a typical surgeon. We had to sleep where we could. None of you know who this man is, but this man is a saint. This is Alonzo Mourning. He's a, a, all, a Hall of Fame basketball player, almost seven foot tall from America. He came in on the fifth day to help us, and it was through his money, $4 million grant, that we were able to then go to the next stage with the new tents. January 21st. Because of Alonzo Mourning, we now, people were starting to come in in bigger planes. We still had to unload the planes ourselves. These were all volunteers that were fl all free flights. If they get to Miami, we can get you to Haiti. But these are the tents that Alonzo Mourning had us set up, and this is now the second week. And if I can show you right here, this is the adult tent. This is the pediatric tent. Right here is the tent where we lived, and I put the wound care tent right in the front of the adult tent so that nobody could miss us. Because people had never heard of a wound care program in a disaster. They knew wound care down the hall, wound care where the people were coming in in wheelchairs, but to have a wound care program under these circumstances was new to them. And what we would do is the volunteers would come in each week, we would say, who wants to be on the wound care team? And we had people that weren't even medical people get on the team but this was the first center, this was our first wound care program. Here are the wards. They were air conditioned now, we had wooden floors. We had IVs hanging with the ropes, with this row to row to row. This was triage, 24 hours a day, this was filled. And we had people come in in trucks, in helicopters and some on the backs of their brothers. We turned no one away. Eventually we, will, we would have treated, will have treated over 30,000 patients. 80% of those patients had wounds. We finally got the operating rooms going as the teams came in, but we had no running water and we could not sterilize the instruments so we had to throw the instruments away after every operation. Can you think of the waste that we had? Everything we did, we had to improvise. Everything was new to us, and, every, and we didn't even know each other. But there was a sense of euphoria as the nurses and doctors got together and began to work. And I'll describe this more as we go along. Our first x-ray machine, which was the only x-ray machine we had for the first month. Just pictures that we could see, look at it, and go back to the patient. So how did we set this protocol up with people coming in, some were ministers, lawyers, some were nurses, some were dermatologists. What do we do? Irrigation and debris with saline, betadine, dacon solution in the dirty wounds. 
Topical antibiotics, silver, betadine soaked gauze, Vaseline impregnated gauze, gauze covered dressing, Curlex and Coban. Everybody got the same thing. Everybody. Nothing different. We don't wor weren't worried about collagenase, apple graft. We didn't have that stuff. This is what we had to teach them. After the first week, we changed the dressings every two to three days. We stopped the betadine. We went back to clean saline wash, debridement, saline irrigation, topical silver, Vaseline gauze, Curlex Cobin, and the vax came in. You say, well, how did you have the supplies? Within a week, we had millions of dollars in supplies sent to, me, to, sent to us by the wound industry. KCI gave us $4 million in VAX. I'm proud to say it. Thank you, KCI. The VAX became invaluable to us, and you'll see this as this carries on. Traumatic wound protocols for infected wounds. Finally, we had systemic antibiotics, irrigation agreements, short-term topical antibiotics for betadine soaks, VAX were possible, and daily dressing changes. We still had a problem with American orthopedic surgeons sending their people out from the surgery putting wet to dry on the bandages. They got to know me very quickly. They said, stay away from McDonald because he's getting after us about this wet to dry stuff. But we, had to we still had to teach even under these circumstances. So now we go to the Miami program number two. We saw the first one we saw. But this, as I said, was my wound tent in the entrance to the pediatric ward. And I was very proud to put a sign up wound care. I feel that in a way this was the, one of the real times that wound care got center stage in the world because CNN took pictures of this. NBC took pictures of it, not of me, but of the signs wound care. And people saw wound care. It's not just a clinic down the hall. And wound care is everything right here. This is what we're doing. And these are some of the people that would come in on rotation. At the end of the day, it looks like Gettysburg. This is, this is a doctor. This is a, a lawyer. This is a, a Presbyterian minister. I can't remember. I think this guy is a doctor. We didn't need clinicians. We needed people who could do the simple things. They were proud. This is an ICU nurse. And we made up baskets to go from bed to bed with the dressing changes on your knees. And you'll see how hard that could be. And then we see people like this helping us. And I saw these two, and I thought they were very friendly with each other. And I remember, the, I don't know if they used the word cougar in England. And I said, well, you guys are pretty friendly. She said, we should be. He's my son. <laughs> and we had many families who would come in and begin to work together as wound care providers. This is the minister. It's hard work going from bed to bed to bed to change the wounds. This is the lodging for the clinicians. This is where we lived. It was hot, mosquitoes, 90 degrees. We're right on the tarmac of the Port-au-Prince airport. This was my bed. And my wife, when she saw this, said, that looks like your bed. <laughs> Every morning, we'd have to take care of our own little needs. We finally got showers. Showers, you know, remember, we didn't have water in the hospital, but we could take a shower out here. This was the worst, the latrines. I swear to God. In the first few days, the nurses would hold up sheets for the guys, and the guys would hold up sheets for the nurses, because that's, we had to work together. We didn't have food. We didn't have a canteen. We'd go and find food in boxes, and I soon found that if I closed my eyes, this was a great T-bone steak, and I learned to eat cold chicken noodle soup with my chopsticks. You had to improvise. But it was dirty. It was hot. We weren't sure what we were doing. We were taking care of amazingly critically injured patients. When this little boy woke up, he looked down and he said to the Creole nurse in the French, it translated, how will I get to school? And he said, uh, I'll ride my bike. And he looked down again and he rolled away from us. We had to begin to live with this. We had our own spiritual problems. The, the theodicy, how could a loving God allow this to happen, this unbelievable carnage? I had four men that I'd known for years in Haiti come down to find me, businessmen. I said, how many people do you think you know by name without going between the four of you have died in the last five days? Each one said in excess of 50. 
We were dealing with this as we worked and struggled. We were exhausted. We slept on the job. Every day, at least one or two nurses collapsed because of the heat and had to have IVs. <clears throat> and while we were going through all this on the second or third week, another miracle happened. And I'm going to play something for you now that will describe what that miracle was and get an idea of what we were going through. Under the sun on WLRN tells the stories of South Florida on the air and online. I'm Alicia Zuckerman. And I'm Dan Drash. A few weeks after the Earth Day in Haiti, I met Lynn Nyfeld. She's the head of physical therapy at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And she told me about this extraordinary video that a doctor had taken while he was in Haiti. It took us a while, but we finally tracked down that video. We can't show you the video because of patient privacy issues and also because of radio. But we can play the audio. Okay, so to set this up, we spoke to four different medical staff who were all there for the moment. They are David Pitcher. I'm an orthopedic oncologic surgeon at the University of Miami. John McDonald. I am a retired thoracic vascular surgeon from Broward County. Carmen Maria Romero. I'm a physical therapist. I've been volunteering in Haiti for 10 years. And David Chan, who took the video. I'm an orthopedic surgery resident at the University of Miami, uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital. We also added in some sound that was recorded right after the earthquake in Haiti. It's from the tarmac at the Port-au-Prince Airport and from the medical tent. We landed at night. We arrived into a war zone. Soldiers from all different countries. We smell all this airplane <coughs> darkness everywhere except the generator lights around the airport. We took an SUV to the compound to the tent hospital. The tent hospital is basically comprised of four large tents, like huge cardinal tents. Like a small circus tent, but instead of amusement, you have literally cot to cot to cot. Rows and rows of basic cots with patients. 125 people, and they're all injured. The vast majority of the wound are crush injuries. Crush injuries to the upper extremity, lower extremity, crush injuries to the pelvis. Open huge holes in the skin, legs, fat, broken femurs, broken tibias, and they couldn't get up. The temperature was about 90 degrees, mosquitoes were everywhere, the smell was all mixed in together. It smelled like rotten flesh, like dead rats. The smell of massive humans, of urine, <coughs> urine, stool, unchanged bandages, of wounds, of blood, of, I would say, dirty wounds. No running water, no toilets, and we only had morphine tablets in our pockets that we would peel off put in the patient's mouths like posts. You're feeling and you're hearing souls that have just been cracked and crushed and <coughs> very heavy. How could you not be completely exhausted? We all felt overwhelmed with worthlessness as physicians and realized that uh, this was a catastrophe that was beyond anything we had ever imagined. And then this happened. It was probably between nine or ten. Probably eight thirty or nine, or maybe even nine thirty. It's in the evening. I don't know what time it was. I was dressing warm. I was doing something outside the tent. I was in the tent. I don't know. I'm not sure why I was in I was treating a pediatric case because we were just so short staffed. I had been basically up. 34 out of 36 hours. We had amputations to do. We had debridements and cleaning out infected wounds. I'm kind of mentally preparing myself to go around on all the patients that were there in the tent hospital. It all started up in the upper right side of where the tent was. Okay. Up here. He walks in with his guitar, takes this makeshift chair that we have, and he sits down and he just starts to play his guitar. And then you hear people around the guitar beginning to <coughs> harmonize or sing something. And then each row started to sing. The swell gets louder, louder and louder and louder and louder. louder and louder and louder. And as I open up the door, sound is triple. Everybody, every patient, whole tent. everybody is singing these words. It stopped everything. It stopped all of us. All the sounds of trauma just went away. 
It felt like it consumed all of Port-au-Prince. Was that loud? singing and dancing in the center of the tent. People were jumping up and down. People with head wounds. People that couldn't get up because of their injuries. They were still singing and clapping along. We had one little boy who, <laughs> he wouldn't get up because the pain was just so debilitating and his mother helped him stand up so he could dance on his one leg. I, to this day, have no idea what those folks were singing. It was obviously a chorus that they knew. It's so hard to describe. Something that was not familiar to them. Something that sounds almost religious until I heard the word Jesus. And we turned this, one of the translators and said, what are they singing? He said, they're singing Jesus. Uh, thank you for loving us. It was like a knife hit. I mean, from what we had seen, the teens, the kids, and we sang that way, the joy and the happiness they had, it was a tipping point. Things changed after that. It's extremely humbling to be around the people that, in the worst time of their life, have it in their hearts to give gratitude for what they have left, which is basically dust. I was so broken hearted myself, just so tired, so sweaty, so fly with really. And in the process of pulling themselves up, they were pulling the nurses and the doctors up, giving us a, a great sense of, of hope. I decided at that moment that what I had witnessed was just such a beautiful example of human courage that, that I would do anything in my car, in my life, to help Haiti rebuild. And so I quit my job. <laughs> I left my family, which is my immediate family. I have an identical twin, two older brothers and an older sister, and a and my mother and father. And so when living in Haiti, I took a position in partners in health to support local Haitians to heal themselves. I think at that moment, they gave us the opportunity to really understand them and their pain and their strength and their belief. I don't think anybody in that room will ever be the same. February 11th, we move on. We had another airplane. Somebody said, we're flying Virgin Airlines. I, we're going to the Caribbean. I said, no, no, this is Vision Airlines. You're coming to Haiti. You have to see things are different. We found the tent cities. Remember I said there's still 450,000 people in these tents. This is a picture from above to imagine. And if you can imagine, Hurricane Isaac just went through Haiti a few weeks ago. Just that alone, the water and the rushing and the irrigation, the erosion, the cholera, the sexual violence, the criminality, the conditions are almost hopeless even today. But now we had security. We were able to put a little fence up around our hospital and we had the Miami Wound Program number three. We decided to put the 15 people that came in every week, we would get 15 and make teams. We had a bedside triage team of people that would go from bed to bed. We had a pediatric surgical little ward where we did, our, all, we did all of our pediatric dressings under conscious sedation. And that's important to remember that we were able to do that. We had the adult surgical where we would do the debridements, where we would apply the vax, and we, then we had an outpatient clinic. So this was the essence of the wound program. And as you see from the, the, the map here, here was the OR. 
This was the peds tent. We had a little operating room for pediatric wounds and the adult, adult wounds. This is where we slept, and here was where our outpatient department was. So wound care dominated, dominated the hospital, and it was, it was big time for them. I was very proud that we had a new sign. We had a new tent. We had supplies. We had better supplies than I've ever had in an American clinic. People were just giving us everything. And we had enough supplies that left over lasted us for a year. This is our outpatient. We were eventually seeing, remember, the, even we went till July of 2010, so we didn't see acute injuries. We were seeing return injuries and people beginning to come in from Port-au-Prince. This is the pediatric surgical tent, changing a dressing on this child amputee. This is the adult where we would do 30 to 35 patients coming into the adult wound. This is all wounds, strictly wounds. It was pain. We did the best we could with our sedation. And there were flies, and it was dirty, and it was difficult. Changing dressings on external fixations at the bedside was backbreaking for these people. Every morning at 6.30, the chief medical officer would greet us as we all got up. Everybody would get their assignments. We'd go to work in our each individual areas for the day. We had great support from the military, in particular, the Israelis. The Israelis were in there on the fourth day. They had a whole hospital set up to give us support. We had the HSN Comfort, United States Navy Ship Comfort, where we eventually could, could send our, our major surgeries out by helicopter. They gave us tremendous support, but they didn't come in until the third week. And until then, we had nowhere to ship our patients. The military was a blessing for us, the American military. And many of the American military people told us they saw more carnage there than they had seen in Afghanistan and Iraq. But we began to see other wounds now, skin grafts that were infected, pressure ulcers. Remember, we had 20 quadriplegics, paraplegics sleeping on cots in the beginning, no one to turn them. We had enormous problems with pressure ulcers. We had the wounds with the external fixation, and we had the vax. Thank God for the vax. And we had canisters, and we had the foam, and we were able to use it. When we did our dressing changes in the beginning, we had no chart, so change, here's the dressing change when the child needs it. Closed mid humeral fracture and quake return 14th of February. But eventually we had a computer, and we were able to get more and more order from the chaos that came on, and everybody contributed, and nobody complained. It was never, who's the boss, who isn't the boss, can you help me, no, I'm too busy. People just gave. And as the head of the wound care program, I sometimes was able to do a little treat for my guys. And one evening, I told them to come into the outpatient tent, and they found that I had put a little bit of vodka in there, and I was their hero for at least 24 hours. But the supplies came in trucks, most of it unmarked, just dumped beside the tents. And there was so much waste. But we would have to go out and scrounge for food, for canned food, and for medications. Wound care by the numbers. 80% of the patients had wounds. We did 140 amputations in the first 30 days. The, we did an average of 160 wound dressings a day. We at one time had at least 40 vacs. We were, would split the vacs, one vac for two people in operation. We were seeing 75 wound outpatients per day. We had six to 15 wound team members every week. The average tour of duty was six to eight days. The number of showers for any of us was one to twice a week. But as we went on, the euphoria was there. We began to feel this sense, as I said, as a, of a student nurse, of a physical therapist, the feedback from the Haitians. This is, by the way, is the girl that you heard. This is Carmen, the girl you heard on the audio. We had a problem. We had so many orphans, and then naturally, the first thing that the nurses wanted to do was adopt these kids. And we had to make sure that that was something that was obviously not going to be able to happen. But there was a connection that we had with the Haitians because of what they were teaching us. They never complained. Never, and even today, I have never, ever had a Haitian patient, and I'll talk about our clinic, suddenly say, doctor, get over here, or I need this, or I need that. One of the most difficult things for me was on the second day when I had a man in his 50s, obviously dying in congestive heart failure. We had no diuretics, and the, the son and daughter turned to me and said, what can you do for our father? And I had to say, I can do nothing. And they just backed up and said nothing. Remarkable resilience. But they had hope, 
and they began to feel hope, and they gave the hope back to us. And I have so many, I take pictures of the children saying, it's going to be okay. There was a recent book written called A Paradise Built in Hell. It reminds me of what happened in Haiti, and it says the fleeting purposeful joy that fills human beings in the face of disasters, these are not events to be wished for, yet they can bring out the best in us and provide common purpose. Everyday concerns and societal strictures vanish. A strange kind of liberation fills the air. People rise to the occasion. Social alienation seems to vanish. And that's what we felt with the volunteers that after a week, we made people leave after a week to 10 days because the emotions were so strong, but they wanted to come back. This picture will haunt me for the rest of my life. I happened to be walking back toward one of the tents and I turned and saw the desolation, the despair that we saw with them. And then we would have this for the hope that was coming with the youth. And I remember the words of Joseph Campbell filled me when I was able to feel this. They said, if we are to be clinicians, we must participate with joy in the sorrows of the world. You can't let it hit you. And you as clinicians, you as nurses, you as doctors, you would have done the same thing that we did, just as well. It, it's a natural thing. But that's not the end of it. We were able, after the earthquake, to go back in July of 2010, in June, with our group out of Geneva, the World Alliance for Wound and Lymphedema Care, using the WHO book that we wrote, the white paper for the World Health Organization, talking about the five basic principles of wound care, keeping it simple, keeping it simple. And we gave courses, two courses, to as many clinicians from Haiti as we could. And we graduated a group, Port-au-Prince, in July 7, 8, 9 of 2010, in June of 2011. And from that group, we realized that we can't just come in and leave. We're not there to give a fish. We're there to teach how to fish. We have to create something that's sustainable in wound care and be an example for the rest of the world, if you can do wound care in Haiti, you can do wound care anywhere. And this is the kind of thing that we would have. This is Barbara Bates Jensen. I'm sure some of you know Barbara. The joy of getting these people happy and excited. So we started the fourth Miami program that exists today that I'll tell you about briefly. This is the street that our wound care program is on in a hospital that was a 20-bed clinic but is now a 60-bed hospital run by the University of Miami with our wound program. This is the, 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 the little area of the courtyard. You say, well, how do you do this? How's it paid for? In the beginning, we had all the supplies we needed from the earthquake. But in the first year of the, of the, last, of the, the last year meeting, we have had almost $600,000 in supplies donated to us from 3M, from Medline, from Smith & Nephew, from Convitec, from the major companies. We have, for the wound program, have had to be totally sustainable ourselves. We're with a group that runs the hospital, but this is our clinic. This is a clinic, it's in this little building right here, and here's our sign, and this is our waiting area. We now have a, a, a little canvas roof. We get no money from the government. We have no relationship with the government. We, the hospital gets money from USAID, et cetera, but we are totally sustain, self-sustainable. We have had to go out and get funds, and we've had funds from individuals that supply all of our financing. In the beginning, we had supplies coming from the different companies, but we can't keep doing that. We now have to purchase supplies, and we've purchased supplies from the money that we've obtained from grants. We have, we're building sister clinics around North America where they have doggy bags and care packages of leftover supplies that they ship to us. So we have to work in little increments. And we, most important though, is what we do is we're training Haitians. We're not there doing the work. This is Dr. Francis, just finished a surgical residency in Haiti. We sent him to America to stay with Dr. Treadwell in his home for six weeks to be trained in Dr. Treadwell's clinic. This is my medical director. He's a, he's a remarkable guy. In fact, he's going to be speaking at the Canadian Wound Care Association meeting next month in London, Ontario. But we see all sorts of things. It's not your regular wound care clinic. 
it's amazing what you see. A patient comes in and they said, what is it? They said, my mother's had this terrible sore on her leg for four years. And we see this. Or we see filariasis. I show you this picture. This is pyoderma gangrenosum. We, we didn't know it. We had to work and figure it out. But the reason I show you is that this patient's fingernails. This patient had a hemoglobin of 2.8. We have no, we, some of these people have no insulin. We cannot get hemoglobin A1Cs. If you need a transfusion, you must pay for it. If you need a biopsy, you must pay for it. This patient, though, we sent pictures up to the University of Miami, said, what do you think? Said, yeah, it could be PG. We were able to transfuse the guy. We were able to give him prednisone. And we can even take care of PG in Haiti. Here's a patient with filariasis. This is Dr. Francis. Maggots, maggots, maggots. Taking maggots out of a child's ulcer on their head. This is the kind of thing you're not going to see anywhere in the world but the developing nations. This is from two months ago. This is a child sent from another hospital, a newborn. They were putting an IV in the leg and left the tourniquet on. child had to have an amputation. These are the challenges that we see in our hospital. These are the things that we deal with every day. But we're there again not to give a fish, but to teach how to fish. The people come for hours and hours away. We're seeing 40, 60 to 80 patients a day in the wound clinic. And when you look and see them putting on, our people putting on compression wraps properly, using compression, or debriding. This is a technician who has no medical experience, but we've trained them how to do basic wound care. He doesn't know PG, he doesn't know MMPs, but this guy can heal the 90% of the wounds that are sent to him by keeping it simple, by doing the debridements, by doing what we have to do. We don't have apograft, but we have Vaseline, we have cleanliness, we have debridement, we have simplicity. We even do outpatient VACs. Can you believe that? I'm so proud of this picture when I was down there three weeks ago. They said, look, Dr. Mack, we're using Vax as outpatients now. This is Haiti. So miracles happen all the time. Our patients are happy. And we say thank you, Haiti. Thank you. Thank you.